Bye. This is Caitlin Medeiros with New Bedford Cable Network, and I'm here at the 9th Annual Working Waterfront Festival, where we're celebrating the commercial fishing industry, America's oldest industry and New Bedford's richest. It's the backbone of our whaling city. The festival consists of entertainment, food demonstrations, activities for children, and learning activities. You can even take a tour of some of the boats that real fishermen work on. Why don't you come along with me and we'll take a look. go take a look at the Apollo which is actually going to be featured on a new reality show on the History Channel. Let's go talk to some of the crew. It's really no different than cooking at home, except everything wants to move now. Nothing wants to stay where you put it. And you learn real quick how to keep things in one position. It's a, it's a challenge. There are times where, yeah, you pretty much hear me swearing about every three seconds because this just isn't going to work. <laughs> I've had that stuff jump off the stove onto the floor. I've had tables full of food end up right there on the floor. It happens on occasion, but you know what we learn? We have uh, this rubber matting here that tends to hold stuff in place pretty good, you know? So it's something you get used to. It's not as bad as you might think, but it's a challenge. I've been cooking for 40 years. I uh, used to be the, let's see, I've been captain, mate, engineer, uh, deckhand, cook, all at the same time. <laughs> and as I get older, I'm dropping them. I'm now done with cooking real man and deckhand. So I, I'm only wearing three hats instead of the whole rack. Premiering this Thursday night on the History Channel, 9 o'clock. Yeah. Three shows, one after the other, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, you know, I was down here working one day, and guys come along with their cameras, and they're like, hey, we're going to do a show, a reality show like The Deadliest Catch, and we're interviewing boats. And they interviewed a bunch of boats. For some reason, they picked me, and uh, now we're getting ready to be on TV. I'm originally from North Carolina. I moved here because this is where the money is for fishing. This is the top fishing port for 12 years running in the United States. Yeah, you know, I was, I was a little bit worried, you know, what it was going to be having these guys on the boat in our way, but it was absolutely awesome. The guys that they sent were great. Uh, 
they didn't impede us in any way and we just went with it and we had fun and I told my guys just just do what you normally do and they did and uh, it's been great it's been it's been a good time you know this uh, you know people don't know but you have a 35 percent more chance of dying on a dragger in New England than a crab boat in Alaska this is actually the most deadliest catch in the United States right here in New England so big. Imagine it's not very big when all you can see around you is water. <laughs> you know, when you're on that 12th day and you haven't seen land, it feels yeah. small. Yeah. And when the guy next to you is aggravating you, you can't get away from it. <laughs>
So I'm here with Laura Orleans and she is the Working Waterfront Festival Director. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on over here this year? Absolutely. This is the ninth annual Working Waterfront Festival. Um, each year we have a theme and this year our theme is Fishtails. Fact, fiction, and narrative tradition in fish, commercial fisheries culture. So we're really looking at the stories um, that are out there. So storytelling plays a big role in this year's festival, but also this idea of fact and fiction. You know, things like reality television. Actually, behind me is a, a vessel that's going to be featured in a new reality television series. But those reality shows are they real? Is it the real deal? Um, here at the festival you will absolutely get the real deal. It's very authentic. We have um, fishermen that are involved. Um, we have all sorts of people from all aspects of the industry involved. We don't tell anybody what to say. We don't give them a script. We don't dress them up. Um, you know, it's really an, an opportunity to learn firsthand what the life and work is all about here on the waterfront. Um, so anyway, back to the theme, fact fiction, narrative tradition. Um, so the other things about fact and fiction, you know, we feel like there are lots of misconceptions about the fishing industry. A lot of people don't really know what it's about and that's really what our festival has been about from the beginning is giving people a window into this world an opportunity to cross over Route 18 and come check it out. You can get on board boats, um, you can watch fishermen contests which show you all the different skills that are involved. Okay guys, um, the rules being this year is you can either start off with a knot as Steve has here or you can just do the straight up double hitch on the three-legger up here when you start. So that you can choose which way you want to do, but I want to see all the proper knots, none of the quick stuff that you guys do offshore. And ready, set, go! Come on, crowd, let's go, cheer them on. We've got, we have Albert Carson over here, captain of the Becky Smith, he's working over here. We've got Steve Wright, right here. He's on the fishing vessel Donnie C. We've got Rick Rosen. He's working on the fishing vessel what? Torture Run. We've got Megan Lapp from Radars. That's uh, the company where I work. And we've got this gentleman here. You are John Santos. What boat do you work on right now? The nets they're fixing is a six inch mesh size. This is standard in the ground fish fleet today. And it's a poly material four mil, also standard. Yeah, Albert. Let's finish your hole up, just drop the needle back away. You have to inspect it, it's correct. for that one. All right. All right. Good job, Steve. Good job. All right. Okay. We got first. We're working on second and third right now. All right. Number two over here. Oh, is this number three? Is she three? Yeah, three. Three. Oh, okay. Yeah, Megan. Megan's three. Um, there's obviously music and storytelling and poetry. Well, maybe that, that's not obvious. There are fishermen, believe it or not, who write poetry about their lives and experience. Of course, there is food. There's great food. Yeah. This year, the United Fishermen's Club is taking over the helm of the food, and they're doing all the fried seafood dinners. I have heard rave reviews. I haven't yet had a chance to taste it myself. Um, we have an artisan's marketplace, so if you want to get your holiday shopping off to a good start, um, all unique handcrafted items that relate to the sea. Uh, we, have an, we have authors who come and they read, they sell their books out of our festival store. We have children's activities, we have a tugboat muster, a blessing of the fleet. There's something for everybody. What do you think attracts people the most to the festival? Well, that's a tough question. I think I would have to say the food is probably number one. Yeah. 
Um, and then I think the opportunity to get on board a working vessel, you know, how often, if you're not a fisherman or not a fishing family person, how often do you get to get on board a scalloper, a dragger, a tugboat, you know? So it's like, you know, the opportunity to go inside, see the galley, see the wheelhouse, talk to the fishermen, that's pretty un unusual, pretty unique, and I think that's a big attraction as well. Yeah. Um, my uncle, he actually owns a couple of fishing boats, and I've never even been on one, so it's kind of unfortunate. So this is really a good opportunity for that kind of stuff. thought to the other end of this life, the family, friends, and toys, but mostly to the wife. Just stop and think about her life as she waits there at home, maybe surrounded by family and friends, but in so many ways alone. Yet having to be in fully charged and dealing with all the things that come along, facing all the problems herself, while keeping the marriage ship sailing strong. As she watches him leave again, she feels abandoned and alone, even though she tells herself her job is keeping up the home. While well, she has her morning coffee, watches trees bend and sway, can't help but feel a sense of worry for a man so far away. The sound of wind and rain bring the worry on to nag, until the phone brings his voice, the time just seems to drag. When storms hit, we anchor up. Her storms must be fought on through. Problems face and tell resolve, no other course will do. Now children's love and arms are also tender and sweet, but sometimes only a man's embrace will make her feel complete. Raising a family and keeping a home sure isn't busy work. There's always a million things that she can't ever shirk. Stretching limited dollars and nurturing children's health and minds is a constantly demanding job without any closure time. And if she has to work a job to help sail her financial ship, that's just on top of all the rest with which she has to grip. The thrill of housework and shopping sure can't compare to that big haul if she keeps on keeping on waiting as returning in the fall. And we come rolling home like conquering heroes whom everyone wants to see. But she wasn't there with her steady in hand. Well, at home just wouldn't even be. I guess I repeat myself on that one. I'm sorry, folks. Job interview. She trudged past the fuel dock to the transient float. Everyone said there was a skipper down here who needed crew. He said he was a little bit of a screamer. But he was fair and he hired women, more of an a-hole than a creep. She wanted a job, God, she wanted a job. She was tired of her leaky tent in remote Rainy Gibson's Cove, the one spot you could legally camp near the miserly town of Kodiak. And even that was a minimum half hour trudge to the harbor, in the rain, usually. She was tired of meeting people, boys usually, who were greenhorns like her, who each by each got jobs while she stayed on hunting and hungry in the gravel pit campground. She really didn't want to give up and work in a cannery like everyone suggested. It was almost eight in the morning. Get there early, they said. Catch them in the morning. The season starts day after tomorrow. As she walked towards the transient float, she spotted the boat. A little scrappy, but it was a boat. A bearded man in blue emerged from the cabin and vaulted the rails onto the float. He headed toward the ramp, paused to yell back at the boat, then continued. Her heart quicker, quickened and she felt a flutter of nervousness. That's him, she thought. My last chance. I gotta get this job. Okay, okay. Say something. Here he comes. She waited at the top of the ramp. He barely looked at her, eyes on his truck, mind on his list. I hear you need a deckhand. She squeaked. Damn it. What's that, he said. Turned towards her head bent in the habitual way of the engine death. I what? You need a deckhand? 
Yeah, he looked at her. You looking for a job? I can start right now. You got any experience? She knew it. Big fat no. How is she supposed to get experience? I can cook. Well, he said, can you pick up that rock? He jutted his chin toward a small boulder. She looked at him like a sheep, still hearing the imagined no thanks in her mind. What? She said startled. Can you pick up that rock? He repeated, a little low, louder, a little slower. He folded his arms. It was a good-sized rock, but no bigger than the sacks of coffee she lifted at the cafe she used to work at. Without shrugging out of her backpack, she squatted down, embraced the rock, and picked it up, being careful to lift with her legs, her heart, and her soul. Okay, he said, and turned around. Be at the boat eight tomorrow. Get your reindeer and your license today. You got money for that? He was already in his truck, rolling the window down, still talking to her. Yeah, she said. Good, don't be late. He pulled out and then he stopped. What's your name? Megan, she said, still holding her rock. Okay, Peggy, he said. Welcome aboard. <laughs>does it take to prepare for the Working Waterfront Festival? Um, I actually begin writing the grants, like in fact I wrote the grant for next year back in March. Oh, wow. So it's about an, a year and a half in advance that we start planning. It's very funny because people call, you know, last week they were calling and asking, can I get involved, can I have a booth? And we're thinking, where were you, you know, six months ago? <laughs> so it's a lot of planning. We actually start setting up the tents a full week ahead of the festival. Um, it's a big production. I have a great, great team of people that make it happen for me. I kind of come up with the ideas. They make it all possible. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Derek Freights. I'm here today for out sponsoring the Fisherman's Tribute Fund. I am the site and design chair on the committee and today we are promoting what we hope to be um, a great day in New Bedford's history when we finally put the um, monument dedicated to all fishermen past, present and future who have served uh, their lives, this community and helping everyone here. So what we're doing here today we have running a 50-50 raffle. We also are selling our dedication stones which will be as part of the construction of the monument and um, today we have the artist with us Eric Durant a local artist and we have on display uh, Marquette which is one-third uh, the size of the actual monument which will be a life-size monument hopefully in the south end of New Bedford we're in negotiations with the city and Eric's going to tell you a little bit about the Marquette and what went into uh, our design here for the monument. So, uh, so this is a this is a third scale uh, a third scale maquette for the uh, for the Fisherman's Tribute Monument. Uh, the final version will be uh, all life size figures, uh, so it'll be approximately the size of uh, regular people, um, uh, and it'll be cast in bronze. Um, uh, right now, the uh, the composition of the uh, of the piece is a sort of triangular composition that sets up relationships between the figures. The uh, the idea be the idea. Um, uh, is that, uh, or part of the idea is that you know you don't know whether or not the fisherman is going out to sea or coming home. So there's a sort of uh, ambiguity that's built in in that sense. Um, huh? uh, the uh, the the. Uh, the, the, the figures represent uh, parts of the, the fisherman's family, so at the, at the head of that is in the top of the pyramid is the, uh, is the, the mother figure. Um, she has a, a relationship between, with the daughter and then the father and the son who are sort of um, sharing a, a moment. Um, I got involved. Uh, I got involved through some people that I know in the local community, um, and uh, found out that the uh, that the, the committee was looking for a sculptor who could do uh, realist bronze figures, and uh, so my name got sort of tossed into the mix.
Athos and I'm here today with the Fishing Partnership Support Services and we are a nonprofit that supports the fishing industry with health and well-being benefits. And uh, we uh, sponsor safety training for the fishermen and we uh, also provide access to health care benefits in the state of Massachusetts and help people uh, navigate the options that are available to them. And uh, we have an employee assistance program and the kind offer the kinds of benefits that fishermen might not um, otherwise have available to them. And uh, the best thing about it is the program is completely free. Shana Jabork. I work with uh, the Northeast Fisheries Observer Program, a division of NOAA Fisheries. Uh, what we do is we deploy observers in the gillnet fishery, the trawl fishery, the scallop fishery. They deploy anywhere from day trips to up to two weeks or so. Uh, they go out with the commercial fishermen, they identify all the fish and other stuff that comes up on board. They weigh it, they record it, sometimes they take age structures. Um, and basically they report back to us. We help monitor the fisheries. We, uh, we want to go out and take unbiased data so we stay away from any kind of regulatory information. Uh, we don't like to tell our observers any of that. Um, we're strictly basically field biologists out in the field. They can bring real-time data back. Um, it helps with the sector stuff, helps with their discard rate in the scallop fishery. It helps us monitor the yellowtail catch that's going on on George's bank. Um, so yeah, we definitely stay away from any kind of regulatory information. I'm Keith Knowles. I'm the chief engineer at the Covanta facility in Preston, Connecticut. We're a waste to energy company. We burn garbage, make electricity from it. We're here today supporting the New Bedford Waterfront Festival uh, because of our partnership with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NOAA, and Snitcher Steel Industries, where we are here with the Fishing for Energy program. We uh, encourage the fishermen to bring their uh, used uh, fishing gear, put it in a dumpster on the docks here, and then that is transported to Schnitzer where it's chopped up into a usable size where we bring it to our plants and we put it into our process and burn it, uh, turning the fishing gear into energy in our boilers. Uh, the program's been in place for since 2008, about four years now. And it's all free of charge to the fishermen. It's a great program for them, rather than just go dump their gear out into the ocean. And now, do you find that they, a lot of them take part in it? Yes, yes. We're into thousands of tons of material has been processed now in our, in our facilities. My name is Holly Ashton and I'm here representing IRIS, the Marine Trades and Technology School in Newport and Bristol, Rhode Island. We have three full-time programs at IRIS, a two-year wooden boat building program, a six-month composite technology program that teaches manufacturing processes of carbon fiber and fiberglass, and a six-month marine systems program. And that program teaches all of the inside systems of the boat, so engines, electrical, plumbing, HVA, refrigeration. Um, all of our programs have internships and then we help place our students in jobs afterwards. Sundown below, travel away and go away, 
sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Down in the hole below. Sundown, sundown below. Time for us to roll and go. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Doesn't dinner pale? Sundown, sundown below. Before she sail. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Wait and roll away. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Sundown, sundown below. Wishful thinking, oh, very wishful thinking. This again is a song from the Caribbean, and it's about uh, sponge fishing. It originally was a religious anthem, and it was turned into a work song used by the sponge fishermen in the Caribbean. And um, when a blight hit the, uh, the, the sponge area in 1938, that was sadly the end of the uh, sponge fishing. However, the song did remain. It's called Mary Come Join the Religion. Mary, come join the religion. Oh, Mary, oh, then Mary, come, come join, join the religion. religion. Oh, Mary, young gal, oh, then Mary, come, come join the religion. Oh, Mary, oh, then Mary. Join the religion, oh Mary, young gal, oh then Mary, come join the religion, oh Mary, oh then Mary, come join the religion, oh Mary, young gal, Mary was forced to go and over, oh Mary, oh, wait till she reached back home, oh Mary. Oh, 